So this will be our last video for chapter 17, where we're going to get into cardiac muscle, um, the electrical activity, circulation, development of the heart as well. So let's get into cardiac muscle and electrical activity first, where we're going to talk about the structure of cardiac muscle, kind of review some stuff should we review from histology. But just in case we forgot, we'll cover that. We'll look at the components of the conducting system that basically helps the heart contract, right? So it's going to help send electrical signals out to cause heart contraction. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the characteristics of a normal um, ECG or normal electrocardiogram as it relates to the cardiac cycle. So if we look at the microanatomy of cardiac muscle, so we're going up close looking at the individual cells. Again, this should be somewhat reviewed, but if not, um, if you don't remember it, this is your second chance. Um, but remember these cardiac muscle cells that kind of branch out, right? They're going to giant, join up together at the intercalated discs. And we're going to kind of put a focus on those because this is going to be where we have um, these gap junctions. And these gap junctions are going to be where we can basically create a tunnel going from one cell to another to rapidly communicate electrical signals with each other. So rather than having to send like a chemical signal out and across the gap between the cells, we can simply allow it to continue through the channel, right? Allow that electrical signal to just go through the channel. So then let's go ahead and look at the conducting system of the heart. So we're looking on the grand scale. How are we regulating heartbeat, right? Because if you think about it, the heartbeat has to be very well coordinated to effectively pump blood, right? To effectively work as a pump. And so how do we make sure that the atria contract first and that when the atria contract, the ventricles are relaxed and that when the ventricles contract, right, the atria are relaxed and then we have relaxation for all four chambers. How do we make sure we keep that pattern going? It really comes down to this conducting system, kind of like the wiring, so to speak, throughout the heart. Um, and the major player, the one kind of in control when we're looking at the heart itself, is the sinoatrial node, also known as the SA node. Right? This is going to be the some, what some people call the pacemaker of the heart, the natural pacemaker we find in the heart, is the SA node. Um, I will probably just call it SA node, right, um, just for short, uh, throughout the video and probably also on like tests, but if you see sinoatrial, you should know that's the SA node. So the SA node is going to be in control, right, and then it's going to basically cause the atria to contract. Um, we also have the AV node down here, which receives a signal from the SA node, and it's going to receive that through these three pathways. The anterior internodal pathway, the middle internodal pathway, and the posterior internodal pathway. And you can guess where you would find these. I know on a, a two-dimensional image you can't really see it, but um, we have the th anterior which would be coming through the front, the posterior would be wrapping around the back, right, to the AV node. The AV node then can pass this signal down through the AV bundle, right, and I'll probably just say AV bundle for short, to keep it that uh, nice and sweet. And then down through the left and right bundle branches. And they're going to then branch down and around each of the ventricles, right? So the right will go around the right ventricle, the left will go around the left ventricle. And then we have all these little fibers kind of coming off called the subendocardial conducting network or the Purkinje fibers. And I'll just say Purkin Purkinje fibers because it's nice and short. But this is, um, for the most part, what's going on. We also have the Bachmann's bundle, which is going to help send the signal over so that the left atrium can contract with the right. Right. So this is the system we have in place. Now, we're not going to get into all the details of how we regulate heartbeat, um, but you should know the player. So that way, when you get to physiology, SA, AV nodes, Purkinje fibers, all these things sound familiar. If we look at what they, they cause or like what action happens with these um, the conducting signal being sent out on a rudimentary or a basic level, right? so here, number one, no signal is being sent. Number two, the SA node has sent the signal. That signal starts to travel, and as it travels throughout the atria, the atria contract. 
the natria relax as the signal is sent down through the um, to the Purkinje fibers and that will cause the ventricles to contract while the atria are relaxed. Then as that signal fades, right, we're going to relax right, and we go back to start where everything is relaxed. And so we're just going around in this circle, right, of SA node sends out a signal that causes atria to contract Right, our AV node takes and passes that down to the ventricles, the ventricles contract, and then everybody is relaxed on both ends. We can monitor this using like uh, an electrocardiogram. So if we're looking at like a 12 lead, um, I know it says a 12 lead, but there's actually only 10 points for this. So a 12 lead ECG is going to use 10 points, and this is the placement that we would use for those. Right, so. Um, you don't need to memorize how to set this up, um, but just kind of keep it in your head, right? We're going to have a lot of them that are in the chest, right? Kind of following away and then also wrists and ankles. Um, for some cases, someone may be monitored just in the clinic or they may be monitored for an entire 24 hour period using like a Holter monitor, which is just like a little purse um, that contains that monitor and then they have the leads connected to them for the day. And this is the readout we would get if a person had a normal ECG reading, right? There's the main components. There's the P wave, the QRS complex, and then the T wave, right? And so the P wave is going to be when the atria contract. The QRS complex is when the ventricles contract. And then the T wave is relaxation, right? Ventricular relaxation. And this is what they would look like under normal circumstances. However, um, sometimes when someone's heart is acting strange, they have some sort of condition, disease, um, whatever, then the ECG readings can be uh, different. They can look different. And depending on how they look different can tell us about what problem that person's having. Now, before you get nervous looking at this, you are not going to need to memorize all these. This is just to kind of provide you a sample, um, just so that you understand that if an ECG looks abnormal, right, the way, the, the type of abnormality in the ECG can actually give us information about what's going on with the heart, right? Again, you will not need, do not sit here and try to memorize all these and all the pictures and what they are, you know, what causes them like atrial fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia. We are not, you are not going to need to memorize those. Um, some of you may move on and learn how to read ECGs. Um, this is not the class for you to do that because that takes more time and practice and it takes experience to really get good at it. So we're, don't, don't worry about this. Just know, hey, that's abnormal. You, that's the only thing you should really be able to do here is compare normal versus anything that's abnormal. So if I gave you like a picture of this, you should be able to say that's an abnormal EKG or ECG. You don't have to tell me what the specific problem is. All right, let's go into coronary circulation. So again, this we, 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 we have a whole chapter on the blood vessels, but that's focusing on the blood vessels we find throughout the body. Here, we're gonna focus on the blood vessels that service the heart muscle itself so that the heart can keep going. So we'll talk about the veins and arteries that are involved in coronary circulation. Some of these we've already talked about in the last video, so I won't go crazy here, but it's just another chance for you to kind of learn something that you probably didn't pick up on in Bio5. So if we look at circulation, right, we have lots of different blood vessels that service the outside of the heart, which makes sense because it has a very important 24-7 job. So we have the right coronary artery, the left coronary artery. See that those are branching right out of the aorta, right? So they're not coming from within the chambers, right? They're coming from the aorta. And as they come down, right, we have the, ar the atrial arteries that come off and service the atria. And this right coronary artery will come down and then form the marginal artery, which runs along kind of the bottom of that edge, right? That margin, hence the name, down there. 
We also have the circumflex artery, which is going to make its way around. So it's going to kind of come around that left atrium. And then we have the anterior interventricular artery, which is coming down and right along that septum, right? Right kind of dividing left and right ventricles. So those are the arteries servicing the heart that we see on the front. For veins, we see the anterior cardiac veins, the small cardiac vein, right, following along the marginal artery on the right. And then on the left, we see the great cardiac vein following along with the anterior interventricular artery. On the back side, we see that circumflex artery wrapping around. Same with the great cardiac vein wrapping around. We see where our cardiac veins are dumping into, how they're going to dump into the um, right atrium in the back. They're kind of joining up near that vena cava. And that makes sense because they're, they're draining blood from the heart so it can get reoxygenated. The coronary sinus, see how it's kind of wider than um, everywhere else, right? It's more open. We have the middle cardiac vein running along the back middle. Right, so those are going to be the veins. Oh, and then also the posterior cardiac vein. So those will be the veins. Um, in terms of the arteries, cir circumflex uh, artery is going to then turn into the marginal artery. Right, so you see how we're kind of branching around. Right coronary, coronary artery and the other marginal artery. Again, those are just the ones we find on the sides, right, on the sides of the heart. And then the posterior interventricular artery is running down the back, dividing left and right again. So these ones should be easy to identify, the anterior and posterior um, interventricular artery, because the location and the name, the name tells us everything about where to find those, right, for both of them. Now, sometimes we can have a blockage. This is when, like, atherosclerosis uh, comes into play, where you have some sort of buildup, some sort of blockage in, um, in a blood vessel. And so in this case, we see this atherosclerotic coronary artery. So we see there's a blockage of the common trunk for the left coronary artery and another blockage at the circumflex artery. Um, these blockages is what can lead to some, like something like a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. Um, the heart attacks are not always immediate, like you don't necessarily just have a heart attack and fall over and die, right? It's not saying your heart is stopping, it's just saying that there is a blockage in the vessels that service the heart. So like in this case, um, the circumflex artery and the left coronary artery are blocked, and so the muscle that gets serviced by those arteries will be deprived of nutrients, deprived of oxygen, and so they will start to die. Um, and so that's why someone would experience the symptoms of a heart attack, right? Like the pain, right? The pressure on like the chest, right? Because their, their muscle is literally starving, basically. The heart muscle in that section is literally starving. Um, and so we can do things to treat that. Maybe we give a medication that dissolves the blockage. Maybe we go in and we do a, like, there's like a catheter we can use. Um, or we do a bypass where we bypass the blockage. So this is a surgical procedure where we remove a blood vessel from another location and we basically reroute the blood um, around the blockage. And the last thing here we're going to get into is development of the heart. And um, so I'm not going to be too, too worried about this. So we'll just kind of talk about have a basic understanding and then um, go from there. So what we're going to be able to do here is we're going to talk about how the heart develops its structures, the five regions that we find in the fetal heart, and then what those structures in the fetal heart become when we look at the adult heart. So if we look at how it happens over time, so at 18 days, this is all we're, we're looking like, nothing crazy, um, but we're already seeing the development of cardiogenic, um, basically this is the cardiogenic area. It's not a heart yet, it's just the precursor cells that'll lead to it. Same thing with like the primitive blood vessels. Those will become blood vessels, they're just not there yet. At 20 days we see like these tubes that we call endocardial tubes. So it's like a blood vessel that's starting to go through a modification process. The tubes fuse together 
and continue to fuse to form this truncus arteriosus, bulbus cordis, primitive ventricle, and primitive atrium. And if you notice, the atria are at the bottom, right? They start at the bottom, and it's as we go through, we see that we fold up, right? right? So we go from like this long tube, we actually fold up and around. And so if you think about it, that makes sense why the muscle is the way it is. So remember that picture of like how we had like the, the cup looking um, structure to the atria and then the ventricle muscle kind of did like a like a figure eight type thing now looking here that kind of makes sense why it does that right because we're doing this whole like shimmy right this little dance as we develop throughout like the first month um, of development and so we end up with these five structures right we have the atria we have one ventricle we have the truncus arteriosus and the aortic arch arteries which are coming through um, eventually we do partition into the actual four chambers, right? So now we see the atrium, we see the ventricle, um, and as we go through that process, we see the septum develop. So that septum gets longer and actually connects. Um, and Kate, and the only time you would see this not do that is like if you had that like tetralogy of fallow um, where you didn't actually fully develop that septum, but in most cases you do develop that, right? We see the valves, the tricuspid and the bicuspid, aka mitral valve developing, and the um, two atria. And if we notice, the two atria are connected through the foramen ovale, which does become the fossa ovalis in the adult heart, right? So blood can go from one side to the other. And if we think about it, um, why bypass? Why, why are we bypassing the right side and not going through the pulmonary circuit? Um, because the lungs are not working yet, right? We're not getting oxygen from the lungs yet. And so we can just bypass that right side, go right to the left to be pumped out because we're, what we're getting our oxygen from is actually from the mom, right? Through the placenta um, through, and through like the umbilical cord connecting to the placenta and then getting oxygen exchange with mom's blood system. Um, that's where that's happening. So we have this foramen ovale to bypass that right side of the heart, bypass the pulmonary um, circuit because the pulmonary circuit at this point is absolutely useless in terms of oxygenation, right? They're not gonna get that oxygen from lungs that don't even breathe yet.